I'm Maya Travolsi tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. She was the last northern white rhino in North America. All eyes on the San Diego Zoo as the world mourns the death of Nola and what may be her lasting legacy. Immigration reform continues to be a polarizing topic on the campaign trail. I'm Kenny Goldberg. A new study that suggests a changing dynamic at the border. There she blows, a patrol boat sunk off the coast of Baja. The travel experts banking on a new underwater addition, expected to attract billion, millions of dollars to the region. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Just as thousands of Americans are about to embark on holiday travel, the U.S. State Department has issued a worldwide travel alert for U.S. citizens due to increased terrorist threats. Travelers are asked to exercise caution in public places and while using public transportation. The alert also advises travelers to be prepared for extra security screenings at airports. The alert will stay in effect until late February. The USS Theodore Roosevelt made San Diego its home for the first time in 29 years. For the families of nearly 3,000 people on board, it was a joyous homecoming after a long deployment. KPBS reporter Steve Walsh shows us the reunions. Among the people waiting on the dock for the TR was the nearly nine-month-old nephew of Ensign Nicole Simolo, born the same day she was deployed in March. For Simolo's own mother, it was a sign of just how long her daughter had been away. What's it like not to be able to see her for so long? Um, very difficult, um, but we're very proud and um, looking forward to seeing her. It's been a long time. Getting into port just prior to Thanksgiving is another bonus for families weary of long deployments. The Roosevelt has been around the world, including a grueling stint in the Persian Gulf as part of the bombing campaign in Iraq and Syria. We did six months in the summer in the Gulf, and I don't, I don't think Americans realize how hot it is and how humid. Uh, we have a heat index approaching 160 degrees. Uh, it just, it, it, it's, hard on, it's hard on sailors, it, it's hard on human beings, uh, it's hard on the ship. Much of the crew will head back to Virginia, part of a three-hull swap that started with the George Washington trading places with the Ronald Reagan in Japan, part of the Navy's strategy to lessen the strain of long deployments. Navy is also shortening future deployments, so the TR will probably spend more time in its new home port. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. And many members of the carrier's air wing took off for their home bases before USS Roosevelt San Diego. Navy Captain Benjamin Hewlett talked on Midday Edition while at sea about the thousands of bombs that were delivered by sailors and Marines on the aircraft for efforts against ISIS. Uh, we delivered over 1,800 bombs uh, on target there, uh, a total of a mil over a million pounds of, uh, of weapons. Uh, I will tell you, having experienced both Afghanistan on two different occasions and now Iraq and Syria, uh, the activity as far as, far as uh, bombing uh, these targets was very high. Uh, we, were, we were delivering bombs uh, on a daily basis. And the port of San Diego will now serve as the new home of USS Theodore Roosevelt. The Roosevelt crew shared this video on Facebook. It shows life on board the big stick, and it thanks to and it thanks all its Facebook fans for their support. They want to reach more than 70,000 likes on YouTube. They're almost at 5,000 clicks online. Lawmakers introduced a new measure for tougher gun laws following the terror attacks in Paris. A recent report revealed a loophole that allowed for suspects on FBI terror watch lists to legally buy firearms. Nearly 2,000 suspects purchased guns between 2004 and 2014. If it passes, the new law would prevent these legal purchases. But gun rights activists argue the measure infringes upon constitutional rights. Police at San Diego State are searching for the suspect accused of attacking a student because of her religion. Officers released this sketch of the man. They say he pushed a Muslim student on campus on Thursday, ripping off her headscarf and yelling at her with racist threats. 
Hundreds of students responded to the, the attack today. As KPBS education reporter Matt Bowler reports, they're calling the attack a hate crime. It started with a call to prayer. Then hundreds marched through campus. When They're demanding an end to hate crimes. Hanif Mohebi from the Council on American Islamic Relations says Muslims on campus worry. When I speak to the students, they tell me they don't feel safe. Mohebi says hate crimes against Muslims happen more often than people think. Definitely underreported. We ask people first and foremost to report it. Report it first to uh, the police department, to uh, civil rights organizations, and anyone that can help, really. But it needs to be reported. Tessa Wiley's majoring in international security and conflict resolution. Wiley says victims need to report crimes to police, and while police solve the crimes, society needs to solve the problem. The problems that we have are not going to be solved by the policemen themselves. The problems we have need to be solved on a social level with our community. Dean of Students Randy Tim says the attack is horrible, but there are also nonviolent indignities that need to be dealt with. And they need to speak out against what are, in many cases, the, the act that happened that is physical and violent, but sometimes there's just daily insults that go directly to your soul. We must all unite. Matt Bowler, KPBS News. San Diego-based Petco retailer has sold the chain. The pet supplies company struck a $4.6 billion deal with CVC Capital Partners and the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. The new owners announced they will keep Petco's headquarters in San Diego, where it was established 50 years ago. After a day as warm as today, it may be hard to imagine cold weather is on its way for San Diego. In anticipation for cooler temperatures, city leaders are making arrangements to provide more shelter for the city's homeless. Kevin Faulkner calls it a major shift in the way homelessness is addressed. On the coldest nights this winter, 200 homeless individuals will find shelter at Father Joe's Villages, while another 50 will be sheltered at the Neil Good Day Center. The plans to help more homeless were announced today outside the downtown facility, which now has the ability to provide year-round housing every night of the year. 40% of the beds are reserved for veterans. This is a direct result to all of us and all of our providers working together to shift, our res to, shift to results driven programs that provide opportunities to help our fellow San Diegans permanently get off the streets with the emphasis on permanently. And the new plan replaces the need to put up temporary outdoor tents in the winter months. Faulkner says the new plans are on pace to help 2,700 individuals this year, which is 1,200 more than previous years. San Diego is considering an alternative energy program that would make the city less reliant on San Diego gas and electric. But KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser says a study on how much the program would cost missed its deadline by six months and was incomplete. First, here's a quick explainer on that alternative program called Community Choice Aggregation. Right now, your power comes through SDG&E's system of lines and wires. SDG&E buys the electricity from a variety of sources, including natural gas plants, hydroelectric dams, and wind turbine farms. If the city goes with Community Choice Aggregation, or CCA, our power would still go through SDG&E's grid, but the city would buy the energy, not the utility. A study was underway to do a price comparison between SDG&E and Community Choice. It was supposed to come out in March, but it didn't. When it finally arrived six months later, it was incomplete. So what happened? Emails from city officials show the man hired to do the study missed deadlines, was unreachable for weeks at a time, and finally turned in an incomplete analysis that was difficult to understand. The city didn't pay for the study. Its costs were covered by a nonprofit called Protect Our Communities Foundation. Board member Bill Powers says they stepped in because the city wouldn't. The city could not assert a year ago that it was on solid ground to assume that it would be a, a cost-favorable situation. Even 
Now the city will start a bidding process for a second, hopefully more complete study. City officials say that was the plan all along. Environmental advocate Nicole Kaprits confirms this and says it's more important to get the city's climate action plan approved. Once the city of San Diego passes its climate action plan, the, the legal clock starts ticking. And now it's incumbent on the city to actually invest the time and the resources and make the climate action plan a priority in the next year's budget so that we are kind of taking the steps that are going to be necessary to hit these steep um, reductions we need in carbon emissions. The Climate Action Plan will go to the City Council's Environment Committee on November 30th. If approved, it will go before the full council. One additional update from over the weekend is that SDG&E is taking a step to allow it to lobby on community choice aggregation. It's prevented from doing that by state law unless it forms an independent marketing district. The utility announced late Friday that it plans to do just that. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Sam Golding wouldn't be interviewed for this story, but wrote by email that his study was delayed because of technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. To see his response, go to kpbs.org. The last northern white rhino in North America died this past weekend at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Nola was 41 years old. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson says the critically endangered rhino suffered from a bacterial infection that took hold in September. Nola struggled with a large infected abscess on her hip for months. Vets at the safari park tried treating her with medication. Eventually, there was an operation to drain the infection. That helped, but Nola never completely recovered. KPBS visited with senior keeper Jane Kennedy last Friday. It's, it's going to be a tough day when we lose her, but we'll do, it. We'll, do for, we'll do for her what we would want done for ourselves. We just heard her, and she's just yeah. or whatever that. Uh-huh, she had a little started. breath out. Nola was old and fragile. Her body couldn't fight off the infection. Kennedy says the rhino would be around 100 years old if she was a human. That makes even small illnesses serious. Safari Park staff were all aware how delicate the animal's condition was. Veterinarian Nadine Lambersky says there were many discussions about Nola's health, her medical care, and end-of-life decisions. When there's a decline, we would have had uh, uh, several discussions and meetings, and we, we would all have been part of the process, and it gives everyone a chance to say, she's having a really bad day today. Is that, is that the day that we stop you know, providing care, or is this just a short-term thing, and can we get her through this? Lambersky says there were ongoing evaluations where vets, keepers, and staff discuss the best course of action. You know, we have to diagnose and treat a problem, but we have to constantly remind ourselves to back up and look at the whole animal and look at all the people around her and try to get them prepared for what they're going to see. Here, big girl. Here. So that's her medicine apple. Keeper Jane Kennedy has been bracing herself for Nola's passing for some time. The safari park's other northern white rhino died last December. She says that was tough, but it helped Kennedy be realistic about end-of-life care. Uh, my sister died in my arms when she was in a hospice plan. And so I know what it's like to lose somebody that you really love. And I really love Noah, and I love a lot of people, but I'm going to be really sad the day that we lose her because she is so special. Only three living northern white rhinos remain. They survive in a wildlife preserve in Kenya. None of them are capable of reproducing. But Kennedy holds out hope that the northern whites are not doomed to extinction. If we can take her DNA and we can turn it into that, turn parts of it into her eggs, and then we can take the DNA from a male and turn it into sperm, and we could put them together, and we could put them in a southern white rhino surrogate, we could bring back northern white rhinos. There could be little Nolas in our future. The safari park just welcomed six breeding age southern white rhinos from South Africa. Oh, sweet girl. Curator Steve Metzler says the herd is currently quarantined in a backstage area of the park. This big girl over here is one of our most calm, and uh, so she is a great example for everybody else. As, as she comes over and works with us, everyone else is watching and seeing that we're uh, 
We're good people. Metzler says these animals are the linchpin of an ambitious and complicated plan to revive the northern whites. Keepers will work with the rhinos until researchers can attempt to artificially implant southern white embryos. That's never been done with rhinos before. It requires the development of tools and techniques. All the scientists have a lot of work ahead of them to work out those techniques. And at the same time, our team has a lot of work ahead of them to get these animals comfortable with everything that they, uh, they would be needing to do. If keepers and technicians can deliver with southern white rhinos, researchers will try to implant a northern white embryo into one of these newly arrived females. The team has access to frozen sperm from the male northern white that died last year and genetic material from 12 more animals. Keeper Jane Kennedy is hopeful because researchers are working hard to repopulate the species. If we don't, as a species, humans, do something about the extinction of the animals on our planet, no one will. They aren't going to come back unless we help them. And I believe we owe it to some of these animals to do what we can to help them stay stay on this planet. They deserve it too. Kennedy says Nola's lasting legacy may be her role as a catalyst for her efforts to reproduce her species. She says that's ironic because Nola never had any offspring, even though she lived a long life. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Someone at Helix Charter High School in La Mesa has been diagnosed with tuberculosis and may have exposed others to the disease. The San Diego County Health and Human Services Agency is working with school officials to notify people who may have been exposed from as far back as August 5th. Free testing will be offered to students on December 1st. 184 cases have been reported this year. San Diego crime rate trends show a slight decline for the second year in a row. A county report released today revealed law enforcement officials made less arrests in 2014 than 2013. Violent crime rates increased by 2% in 2014, while property crime rates dropped by 3%. Overall rates show a downtrend. Baja California just started its first artificial reef. Mexican officials sank a ship about 30 miles south of the border off the coast near Rosarito. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has the story. Baja California officials say the artificial reef is meant to attract tourism during off-peak months from fall through spring. Those are the best seasons for scuba diving in Baja because the water is warmer and there's better visibility. To create the artificial reef, the government sank an old Navy patrol boat known as the Uribe 121 on Saturday in Puerto Nuevo, just south of Rosarito. The governor of Baja California, Francisco Vega, says the reef is expected to attract about 40,000 scuba divers a year, as well as $3 million in annual spending at hotels, restaurants, and other businesses. We want tourism sites of high cultural and economic value to benefit our residents. The ship now sits about 90 feet underwater, and it will take some time for a natural marine habitat to develop around it. The Uriba sinking is the first step toward creating a large underwater park there, with marine sculptures and a ship graveyard that will include three more vessels. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. A more than 50-year trend is reversing. More Mexicans are leaving the U.S. than are coming here. That calls into question the view of some anti-immigrant activists who claim the border is overrun by Mexican migrants. KPBS's Kenny Goldberg tells us more about the changing dynamic. The Pew study finds between 2009 and 2014, 870,000 Mexicans came to this country. During the same time frame, more than one million Mexicans left the U.S. Joining us to discuss this phenomenon is Ev Mead, director of University of San Diego's Trans Border Institute. Ev, the director of Hispanic Research for the Pew Research Center, says the era of mass Mexican migration is over. Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think it's right that because of the macroeconomic conditions, um, demographics in Mexico, population that's having fewer kids, getting older, uh, and also because of U.S. border enforcement and the general security situation along the border. I think all these things have contributed to changing 
the decision making for Mexican families about where they live. And it's, it's for many families, it's meant the decision to go back to Mexico. Um, and for those who are coming to Mexico, it also suggests that they're, they're coming from Mexico. It suggests that they're coming for a different set of reasons than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah, what are the main reasons why people are moving back to Mexico? People are moving back to Mexico, according to the Pew poll, 61%, uh, it was for family reunification. Um, that gets kind of complicated, though, because if you look at why people reunite with their families, in some cases it's because family members have been deported and they want to stay together. Uh, and in other cases, it's because it's gotten harder to go back and forth across the border. So people have lost their connections with their home communities or with their communities in the U.S., and they have to make a sort of more permanent decision about where they're going to live. For others, it's just simply a fear of using these coyotes and smugglers who are increasingly involved with organized crime, and people don't want to deal with, 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 with gangsters, and people don't want to face a real risk to their life and come to the United States, so they're not coming. How big a factor has the uh, sort of floundering economic recovery here played in this whole thing? I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's played a huge role. I mean, it's very clear that for many people, access to a good job in the United States is much less certain than it was in the 1990s in the construction boom, for example. Um, so it, it plays a role. It also plays a role uh, in the sense that the Mexican economy has uh, improved dramatically. Since 2009, GDP in Mexico has grown by about 25%. I don't want to point, uh, paint an overly rosy picture there, but you know, cities like Tijuana that used to be transit stops, places that people went to on their way to the United States, they're now cities of in-migration, net in-migration, meaning that people are going there because there are better economic opportunities in Tijuana, and they're not going just across the United States. So this is a real change. How has the failure of the U.S. to reform its immigration system affected these migration patterns? I think it's kind of interesting. In, in some sense, I, it, it has driven some people now to return to Mexico because they've given up hope in a more permanent solution. Um, it's, also, uh, it, it's, it's also played a sort of reverse role because we have done a lot with immigration enforcement. We've really clamped down on the border, and that means that it's harder to cross back and forth and that people have to really make a final decision about where they're going to live. But it also means that people who want to make an undocumented crossing, an unauthorized crossing, have to do so in the wilderness, in these really dangerous areas, and many people are just opting out of that. Now, uh, GOP presidential candidate Donald Trump has made a big issue of asking Mexico, if he's president, mm. to pay for a border fence along the entire U.S.-Mexico border. How does that... Uh, play with the reality of what we're seeing on the border right now? Well, I think what you see is, and I'm so glad the Pew poll came out because it gives us kind of a reality check, a nice fact check, a pause, because it says that things like the images of those kids last summer in the Border Patrol stations or the odd Middle Easterner who's caught trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border or the odd security scare on the border, that they're really far off trend. And the, the much broader trend is that the border is secure and that we're at a 40-year low in undocumented immigration to the United States. So the border is not in crisis. We are not overwhelmed with people. And that should give us a chance to have a real slow, careful, rational conversation about what our immigration policy should be, not a crisis-led reaction. But what's the realistic possibility that we'll have that rational, calm conversation? Well, it's difficult. You know, I mean, we're in a moment that we've had before in American history where we've had a big migration pattern. You know, migration from, the, from Mexico to the United States uh, from 1965 to 2007 is one of the biggest flows in world history. And here, 10 or 15 years later, as those folks uh, seek full incorporation into American society, we're, we're getting the reaction. And it's going to be a tough one, and it may last for a while. Okay, Ev Mead, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Kenny. All right, get ready. Fierce gladiators are back, but not the Roman or even the human kind. Associated Press reporter Terry Che takes us to a world of high-tech entertainment with battling robots. It's California versus Tokyo. In this corner, weighing 12,000 pounds and standing 15 feet tall, the Mark II, created by California-based Megabots. And in this corner, weighing 9,000 pounds and hovering at 13 feet, Kuratas, made by Tokyo-based Sudobashi Heavy Industry. These giants are preparing for an international battle for robot supremacy after the Americans called out the Japanese. Sudobashi, we have a giant robot, you have a giant robot. You know it needs to happen. We challenge you to a duel. 
Japanese said, bring it on, and the first giant robot duel of its kind is set for next year. The founders of Megabots built the Mark II to fulfill their boyhood dreams of watching massive machines fight. We want to bring the giant robots from science fiction and movies and video games to life because now we have the technology. We have the ability to bring all of these fictional characters to life and we want to make a sport out of it and bring it to the world. But this hulking gladiator isn't quite ready for combat. Our current robot, the Mark II, looks pretty intimidating. It's huge. The truth is it's pretty slow, it's top heavy, uh, it's rusty, and it needs a set of armor upgrades to be able to compete in hand-to-hand -hand combat. To turn the Mark II into a real fighting machine, the Megabots team raised more than half a million dollars through a Kickstarter campaign and enlisted help from NASA, software maker Autodesk, and an assortment of engineering experts. We're absolutely confident that Team USA can beat Japan. We've assembled the best of the best in this country. We're not going to let our country down. Win or lose, it's all part of a plan to turn robot gladiator tournaments into big-time entertainment, something robot enthusiasts are eagerly anticipating. Athleticism augmented by no-holds-barred engineering with half-inch thick plate steel and giant hydraulic motors and tank treads and rocket launchers. I mean, how can you go wrong with that? I think it's going to be a smash hit. A high-tech spectacle these robot builders hope will inspire a new generation of engineers. Terry Che, Associated Press. Oakland, California. Okay, enjoy all this warm weather because you will be needing to bundle up soon. Showers expected by the beaches with 60s, cooler weather in the inland valleys with 60s, breezy in the mountains with 50s and 40s, still warm in the desert with 80 degrees and 60s. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.